So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, this may be the largest talk that I've ever given, uh, and I can't see you, so that's cool. Um, my name is Adam Rosine, and uh, I work at a tiny little company called Inner Product, along with Noel Welsh and a few other folks like Stuart Stewart. And uh, we are sort of a sister company of Underscore, which you may have heard of from our books and uh, trainings and things like that. We do consulting in the US mainly. So we do teaching, FP, uh, we do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, which is really great, uh, and we build stuff. So this talk is not about any of that really. It's about functional programming, that's for sure. Um, let me get my Q&A window up, there we go. Um, this is about something very old that I just kind of came across. Oh, I didn't come across it. I've always knew about it, but I was afraid of it. So I figured I would start to learn about it because I had a little free time and I felt like I wasn't a really great programmer. And so I decided to do something about it. So um, I came across this project on GitHub called Curry Howard, and it had all sorts of functional programming trigger words, uh, automatic code generation, Curry Howard, theorem prover, lambda calculus. So I was like, oh, that looks pretty cool. I'm going to check that out. And it does all these cool things that we're going to go into. Um, so everything I, I, I worked on for this um, came from that. So I really wanted to shout out to this project. It's really uh, pretty crazy stuff. So I, I was really impressed with it. And they had a nice video um, that sort of walked through it. Uh, and then I started doing the research into what is this uh, sequent calculus stuff and I came across this link to some rules in the system and it mentioned pizza. So if any, everybody doesn't know, pizza was like the precursor, one of the precursors to Scala that uh, Martin Odersky uh, created. And so somebody had written the sequent calculus, um, some rules for it in pizza. So I was like, this is a sign. I must, uh, I must get into this. I have to learn about this because, you know, that it's, the world is telling me that I need to, to do this. Um, so I kept on doing some more research and I found Heather Miller, who's a big person in our, uh, in our Scala community. She had, uh, she had this uh, post a while ago about, uh, about what is that? Oh, it's the sequent calculus. It, this, is, this is the new hotness. Um, so I was gonna check that out. Um, and then I started programming and I was like, I don't know what these symbols are and I started failing and I felt really low, but uh, you know, you gotta keep going. Um, I wasn't very happy, um, but I kept going and, uh, and so I decided I was gonna fake it till I, till I made it. Um, but I had some help, you know, I had, there's some programming strategies I can use. Like I'm, I'm an old person in the programming world-ish kind of, sort of. Um, uh, I've been doing this a while, I, I can fake it, I can do it. I can just, I know what I'm doing. So I decided to do some programming. Um, so the goal uh, of uh, my goal that I'm trying to share with you all is that uh, we want to do something a bit strange. We want to say, uh, if you give me a type signature, I'm going to generate a program for you. The computer's going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and so sort of this talk talks about, well, what do you need to uh, know about that to, uh, uh, to do it? So that's a pretty big goal, like, okay, computer, do what I want. That's not easy. Okay, let's see what we need to do. Um, so here's our world. Here's the world of programming. Uh, we have types and programs. That's really all there is to it in, in this world. And uh, here we are, the programmers. You know, usually the way that we program is that uh, we come up with a type signature because we're good functional programmers. And then we write the implementation later. Um, sometimes we do it the other way. This way is sort of a little bit nicer because it lets you declare what you want to do. Um, there's other arrows in this diagram. So the compiler, it, it kind of goes the other way. It helps us. It, uh, it generates types from programs. You know, you, uh, you write an implementation and then you can ask your IDE or Scala compiler, what is the type of this thing that I just wrote? And so there's a nice little feedback loop there. But at the same time, there's this world of, of logic formulas and proofs and uh, all the mathy stuff. And we know as programmers that it underlies what we're doing, but um, you know, we, we use it implicitly, but maybe we can use it a bit more explicitly. 
Um, then there's this magical idea of the, the Curry-Howard isomorphism. So this is one of these big words, a collection of big words. You probably heard of currying or the language Haskell. They all come from, uh, from these folks uh, who did lots of other work. But there's this amazing connection that says there's a correspondence between like types and formulas, whatever a formula is, it says they're the same in some way. You can translate between them. And also you can have proofs. Proofs in the world of logic correspond to actual like programs, uh, like the implementation. You know, if types are kind of specifications, then, then uh, proofs are, uh, are really like the actual implementation. So we can sort of go over the line there into a different world. And there's a way to prove things in logic. That's what logic's mainly about. Well, how do I know if this, this expression, this formula is true? And there's all sorts of technology and mathematics behind it. Like there's all these proof systems and there's uh, languages around it and prolog and cock and, and all these uh, very um, geeky things that we can use to actually perform these, these uh, proofs. Um, so in this, uh, for this goal that we have of translating from types to programs, we can follow this alternative route. We don't have to just program the implementation. We're gonna translate our types as programmers into formulas, then we're gonna push it over, we're gonna solve that formula with a proof, and then we're gonna zap it back down uh, into a program, and voila, we'll have a program uh, derived automatically from types if we're, if we're lucky. So that's like the big picture. Um, that's sort of the introduction. Anybody? Yeah, I do want to answer questions or, or uh, hear that people are following me. That's the one hard thing. So if anyone wants to give a, a crying face if they can't handle this because it's crazy or a uh, thumbs up. Thumbs up so far. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so that's, that, this is the big plan. This is what we're going to try and do. We're gonna go from types to programs. Okay, so here we go. Um, so we're gonna start at the beginning. Uh, we're gonna talk about how to translate types to formulas. So what are, whatever those things are. Uh, clicking, clicking. So uh, here's a little table. Uh, so there's this correspondence that, that Curry Howard lets us talk about. And um, we can have types, which is sort of the column on the left. Um, types that you're used to unit and nothing and whatever random types you have. I'm going to use symbols like A and B and C. Um, so the unit type in uh, in the world of logic is known as true. Um, like true, true is always true. You can always produce a unit. Here's a unit. Boom, there you go. Um, nothing is a type in in, uh, in Scala and other type systems, and, and it sort of means false. Uh, the reason that the reason that, that those are connected is because, well, you can never produce a value of type nothing. You can never prove false. So I'm gonna try and give these, uh, these correspondences. You can't give a value means you can't prove it. The type that represents something that has no values is the type nothing. We'll have regular types. Um, and then we have uh, pairs of types. So if you had a tuple of A and B, um, that's the same as saying and. Um, we can build up algebraic data types too. Uh, as they're known. So we can and types together as a tuple. We can or types with something like an either. Uh, so on the right hand side, we'll use, uh, uh, you know, fancy, fancy logic symbols and an or. Uh, sometimes I'll use these uh, top and bottom, but they will mainly work in the world of types. Uh, and then we have functions. So the world of uh, functions in types corresponds to implication, as they call it, in uh, logic. But they use the same symbol, so that is very cool. Uh, we can actually make this correspondence between types in programming and formulas in logic uh, with some other things like type parameters, universals, existentials, but I didn't get that far, so we're going to just kind of skip that part. <laughs> um, so that was our, our world of logic, but I'm going to try and encode this in uh, types and in data. So uh, we can do our normal tricks. Uh, we can create an algebraic data type. So we can just uh, build our representation of types and formulas. So we're going to build a representation of formulas. Uh, and they mirror the table I just gave above there. We have um, 
true and false, and we have sort of named types, and then you can and them and or them and then uh, make functions out of them. Um, so this is often called reification. Here's a fancy word for you. And it basically just means I'm going to take something uh, that's code and turn it into data that I can manip manipulate. So that's what we want to do. We want to translate um, types, which is sort of a, a given in our programming language, into some actual structure that we can ma manipulate. So I'm going to translate them into this structure of formulas. Um, so here's an example. So I have um, a type uh, that is a pair of an A and either a B or a C. And then I can translate it into a formula using this data structure that I created. So I have an AND of A, and it's ORed with um, or it's anded with an or of B and C. All right, uh, everyone good with that? Does that sound, does that make sense so far? Not in New York, I'm in Seattle. All right. So one nice thing about uh, type level, gotta mention type level, uh, and, and you know our programming ecosystem that we have is there's a lot of nice helpers. So in uh, in cats, there's this type class called show. That's basically capturing the idea of how do I turn something into a string. So uh, when when we had this uh, representation, uh, you know I built up this data structure of the example. It's this big sort of nested case classes and things like that. Uh, but it's kind of ugly. I don't want to see it when I'm print lining on screen to figure out what I'm doing. Um, so you can create these instances that says, how do I turn this algebraic data type of formulas into, uh, into a string? And it's nice. Uh, you can have sort of your primitives, uh, and then you can sort of do recursion too. So there's this nice little macro that says, OK, well, if I'm anding two things, I'm going to represent it as uh, the first thing and the second thing as a string. I found this to be useful. It's not a very um, fancy type, but it was very helpful. So I really liked it. So, uh, instead of having this big splat onto my screen of, you know, nested um, case classes and so on, I get this nice pretty string here. So I found that to be just a little bit of a, a thing. So I encourage people to use it for their, their beautiful debugging. Um, so we have a representation of formulas, but we need to now translate between types to formulas. So to do that, we use a type class. So I made this type class to formula. And it says, uh, okay, well, if you give me a type A, you can call the two formula method and I'll give you the formula for it. Um, so that's, that's the type class pattern. Uh, this is the type class, and then we need to implement it. And then once we implement it, we could call this method and get a formula for whatever type we want. So here's an example of using that type class. I just made some bogus uh, example traits. Uh, I need to reify, which means sort of to turn this type into a, a value. So I'm going to I'm going to construct a an instance of the two formula type class for the type A, for type B, for type C. They're implicit, so they get looked up. And then uh, with a bit of other stuff, I can sort of summon the instance. I can say, give me the converter of this type that turns this type into a formula, and I can call it, and then I can show the method, and there we go. Ta-da! So what I've done here um, is really just, the only input to this expression here is a type. Uh, and, but what I get out is a value. I get a, a representation of my type. Uh, so that's cool. So now we can lift um, types into a data structure that we can start manipulating in the world of logic. Um, so as part of this, you'll notice that I only implemented uh, A, B, and C. But then I got the ability to um, create formulas for ors, uh, you know, with an either and ands with product. So the way that works under the hood uh, is something like this. We can we can have these uh, what's called type class derivations. So we can get these other things for free. Um, it says, well, if you know how to convert A to a formula, the type A, and if you know how to convert the type B to a formula. I can give you something that says, I know how to create the formula for a pair of A and B. And it's really just uh, the, what you would expect. I, I build a, a, an AND node in our, our tree here using the, the formulas of the two other ones. 
And some types, which are, are, are another name for or, or another name for ors, uh, you can do the same thing. If you if I know how to create the formula for A and I know how to create the formula from B, I know how to create the formula for either A or B. I just construct an or node. So this trick is used over and over again in all the different libraries that you use in cats, in things like Circe, when you're translating JSON structures to and from uh, your algebraic data types. Uh, the idea is you only have to specify sort of the leaves of your tree and you get a whole bunch of other stuff for free, which is really nice. So that's uh, the basics of uh, translating um, types, which are part of the language, into formulas, which is a data structure. We use, we use type classes. All right, any questions there? Everyone? I see your eyes. All right, cool. All right, happy to answer any questions anytime or I'll defer them for later. I have no idea how fast I'm going. I think I'm doing okay. Um, but there's a lot of slides, so I'm going to go through it. Here's the real, here's the tough part. <laughs> so we, uh, we started with types and we translated into the world of formulas in logic. So we used a type class to do that. Now comes the hard part. We have to actually live in the world of logic. So this was very new to me. I heard about these things. I heard about gammas and turnstiles and I don't know what. Um, so now we're going to really dig into how do we prove things? What does that even mean? Um, so kind of the, the goal here is uh, we're going to have this prover. I couldn't come up with a better name. Proof system was a little bit too long. So a prover um, works according to, or according to some set of rules. There's different provers out there, I learned. There's a whole zoo of them. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the oldest ones. But there's a certain set of rules that these things have. Um, but their main job is to prove formulas. And when you prove a formula, you're going to spit out a proof that sort of is associated with that set of rules. Uh, and we'll figure out what a proof really is later. But this is the idea. We want to, we want to, um, we're going to talk about rules and how they translate formulas uh, into proofs. Now, not, proofs won't always work. So we need to handle that case also. Um, so I'm going to need some interaction here. I'm going to need my friends, uh, who are all of you now. We want to do, we want to think, okay, how do I prove this type? And so whenever I say the word prove, that's really going to mean, how do I implement? How do I implement something with this type signature? So, so how would I implement something that said, give me a unit or, you know, what's, what's a program? Here you go. I love this participation. This is great. Val x equals unit is in the uh, in the chat. That's a great place to put. You can put it there. You can put it in the uh, the talks um, channel. All these things. Uh, you win the prize. I'll give you a sticker. Um, yes. So one person suggested unit. There's another person who gave you unit. Thank you. There you go. Here is my proof of unit. Ta-da! This is great. We are doing logic. We are proving. Uh, all this crazy stuff. So, so, so when I say, uh, when I ask, please prove this type, uh, you give me an implementation. So there we go. All right. How about this one? Can you give me an A? Now you don't know what A is. This is, this is kind of a tricky one. Hmm. This one's a little bit tired. Identity, somebody asks. Um, we're going to get to that one. Not quite. Implicitly A. Implicitly, A would work, but um, uh, it would work if it worked, but it's not going to work because we don't know what A is. No, thank you, thank you, troll. Very good. Exists A? Yes, there's lots of one. There's lots. Um, well, we don't really know what A is. We could think of A as um, as a uh, like we could think of it as a generic method. Like if if you uh, if you had def something with a type parameter A, we don't know what the type is. So it's a bit of a trick question, but it's, it's, it's about to get uh, uh, null as inst instance of A will get you kicked out of this conference. I'm just kidding. Um, uh, if we don't know, that's fine. But as someone mentioned, what about this type? This is the uh, identity type. If you give me an A, I will give you an A, but I don't even know what A is. How do I implement this? I guess I said it. But could someone else 
Identity, yeah. So this is known as the identity function. It's a function that doesn't do anything. Um, so the proof of the type, so it's sort of, we're trying, this is the formula we're trying to prove. The proof is the implementation. So here you go. If you give me an A, I will give you that A. There you go. Super, super. All right, we can do that. We're, we're good programmers. Here's a little bit, uh, we're going to get a little bit more complicated. So um, uh, the way we can read this, if you give me an A and a B, so we have a pair, uh, I'll give you an A. So there's some fast typists out there. Mark says first. So there's a, there, we don't actually have a first method. I guess you could pronounce underscore one, which, yay, we have a, we have a mention of underscore one. Uh, I think we should have, you know, first and second, because those seem easier to use to me. So that's just me. Um, so here we go, yes. So the proof of it is if you give me an A and a B, and I don't even care what the B is, I'll give you A. So that's like the, the first projection or whatever you want to call it. So we can prove this, that's good. Uh, how about this one? Uh, if you give me an A, I'll give you an A, or maybe I'll give you a B. Can we, can we implement this type? Left, left. I think I screwed up in my slides. I did screw up in my slides. So you, the audience, are smarter than me. But uh, so imagine this says left because I put A on the left. So here we go. I'll, I'll fudge it there. I'm going to fix it. Uh, and yes, you are correct. I am wrong. Yay, slides. Yes, all you do is you construct a left. OK, so. So the question is, you know, we all know how to do that. How did you do it? Um, or really, could you teach a computer how to do this? There's something that was going on. Like part of what we do as, as programmers is to like, okay, I just did something in my head. How did I do it? Can I teach a stupid computer to do it too? Uh, so that's, that's what we're going to try and do. Um, so here's a more complex formula that sort of puts all these uh, together. So um, here's our goal. Can I, could I implement this? Now you might, um, you might just think through it in your head and instantly pull out the answer. Um, it took me a little bit to do it. Um, but we kind of did the parts. We, we, we knew how to get an, an A out of the pair and we knew how to construct a, oh, my, my example is gonna be wrong too. Oh well, I'll, we'll fix it. Uh, and we knew how to make an, an either on the right hand side. Um, so we don't have a proof. What if we like did it this like in excruciating detail so even a computer could understand it? Um, so, so we don't really have an implementation of this, but we can make it, maybe if we made it a little bit simpler, the implementation would just kind of pop out. Um, so we can do, I mean, you kind of use this structure says, um, if we had this thing on the, if we had something on the left, could we produce something on the right? So what we want to produce is an implementation of this function. Um, well, if, we, if this is an input to a function, um, that sort of means if we had it, we could produce the output. So um, we're kind of going to, we're going to change the structure of this thing a little bit. So if I want to produce a function, that's kind of like if I had the input, I could produce the output. So it's, it, we had a, a more complicated formula and we turned it into two formulas that are a bit simpler. There's no longer this function around. So maybe, maybe we can divide and conquer, which computers know how to do. So if we had an A and a B, can I produce an either C? Well, that's still a little bit too complicated. Maybe I can use the, uh, our simpler rules. Um, so instead of having a pair, I'm going to do a little trick and I'm just going to say, well, I can have more than one thing on the left. You can, you know, these are uh, like isomorphic. If I have a pair of A and Bs, that's the same thing as having an A and a B. So there's a little trick. Um, you can think about it as the left hand side is, is, a, is a value of type formula. This would be one value that's a pair. This would be two values where each one is, a, is an individual type. So can I implement, if I had an A and a B to either A, C? Um, well, I might be able to. We know how to turn A into either A something. Um, so we're going to do a little, something a little bit different that's easier for computers. We're going to say, well, if I have either an A or a C, that means in one version of the universe, I could have an A. So I'm going to choose A. And so 
if we leave, and I'm gonna sort of just forget about the C for a moment. So if I had an A and a B, could we produce an A? Well, this is a really easy procedure to follow. Does the thing I want appear on the left? And it does, look, there's an A and there's an A. So that means, yes, I can produce something of this type. Now, when we say yes in our little example, that means uh, in the world of logic, I have proved it. I know how to go from here at the top, uh, and I've, I've massaged the, uh, the formula enough that I know that I can reach, reach it all the way at the bottom, that I can fulfill this condition. If I had something, I can produce something. So this is, the, this is sort of the mechanism by which um, these proof systems work that translate formulas into proofs. They sort of break, have some complicated thing and they break it down according to some like rules here and they make simpler things. And once you have some, once you have sort of the simplest possible thing, you can say, yes, this, I can do this. For if there wasn't this A on the left, then I could say, no, I can't prove this thing. And then you like backtrack. Does that, does that sort of sequence make sense to folks? Yep, got a yep. I'll wait for, I'll wait for a couple thumbs up, so far so good. All right, not too bad. Not too bad is good, I like not too bad. Thanks, Noel. Uh, all right, so, so I'm gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna add a little notation. So when we have this sort of um, left-hand side and right-hand side where I would break apart um, formulas into simpler things, there's a bit of notation that's gonna help later that is used everywhere. Um, and so we're gonna use this, uh, it's called the turnstile, like you know when you go through in the subway or something and you have to go through the little thing that lets you through if you have a ticket. Um, it's gonna be our little separator. We can't use a comma because then it's gonna look like a pair. So there's this new symbol. So we're gonna put the things we have on the left-hand side. Here we have nothing on the left-hand side. Um, could we produce, this will be our goal, could we produce the thing on the right-hand side? So if we just sort of go through with the other notation, this will get us more familiar with what we need to know. Um, so when we extract those R's, what if you had an A and an A? Um, well, then we can, uh, we can choose, we could choose either one of them because uh, uh, we'd have to arbitrarily choose uh, if you had both an A and an A. Uh, I'll try and show a little bit more about what that means. Um, since we have a function, we can turn a, if we wanted a function, we could turn that into, if I had an A and a B, I could then produce an either A, a or C. So here's our little uh, separator, but we still have the same parts. If I had a bunch of stuff, and this is the thing I wanna do, can I implement it? Is this thing as simple as possible? No, I still have pairs, I still have eithers, I'm not done yet. So we do the same steps as before, we unpair it, we're in just a different representation. Do I have things on the left? that match the thing on the right? Nope, okay. I'm gonna choose A, so now I have an A and a B. I have A and B, and now I have, uh, and I wanna produce an A. Uh, yeah, those are good questions. I will, I, will, uh, I will save those for later. I will definitely get to those answers. Um, so there were some questions about what if you have an A and an A, or uh, translate to either. So this is a bit of a notation here. We're just uh, sort of capturing the idea. Um, this is, if I had this, could I produce a thing on the right-hand side? And we follow this procedure. So these things are called um, sequence. Oh, what do I mean by choose? That's a good question. Um, so you'll note, yeah, I'm getting rid of some structure here. So I didn't lose any information so far. I converted a function and I just ripped it apart into inputs and outputs. I didn't lose any information uh, and I ripped apart a pair into its parts. So I didn't lose any, any, any information there. Uh, but the either, uh, as Kevin mentioned, said, um, I, I'm sort of exploring a, um, all the possible worlds. So in, when I'm a computer, I have, to, uh, I have to explore the world where the either is an A and see if I can prove that. And if that doesn't work, I would explore the world where um, uh, it was a right with a C. So I'm, I'm choosing A, but, 
but it's sort of like I could have chosen C first and it didn't work. And, I, and, I, and then I have to say, well, if it didn't work, I can try something else. So I'm going to try the A. Um, so it's just sort of a, a branching point where, we, where we'd have to try more than one thing. Thanks for that question. Um, so these things in the world of logic are called sequence. So there's something on the left. Uh, they use Greek letters. So there's, there's sort of all this uh, new notation. It's sort of a tax. And I was, uh, uh, you know, overwhelmed a little bit. But it's sort of like you practice and you start to, you start to be able to read these things. So it helps to sort of like break them down. Um, so if the thing on the left is known as the premise, you know, if I had a gamma, then uh, I could conclude that delta, the thing on the right, is true. So if I had, the way I think about it is if I had this premise, then I could prove this conclusion. Or just if I had, then I could do that. That's the notation. Um, this little, the turnstile is pronounced entails. Uh, you'll s I didn't, I didn't really mentally tran I would mentally translate when I would read these papers. Um, but I sort of turned it as a programmer, I turned it more into like a programmer thing, but you'll see this word entails, or if you want to read it uh, the right way, that's what, how you pronounce it. Um, so how would I represent this? Well, uh, I can just make a data structure. I can make a case class, a sequence. And there's going to be, in this world, there's just going to be one conclusion. This is the thing I want to prove on the right-hand side. And then there's going to be a bunch of things that are premises. If I had these premises, then perhaps I could prove this conclusion. So I have this data structure. So here we're going to get into a bit of notation again. Um, but we're, the, the procedure that we went through when we had, we said, I want to, I want to prove this formula, this fancy uh, complex formula, and we would break it down. Uh, that's known as deduction. I'm going to simplify my expression. So for example, um, if I want to prove a function from A to B, I can translate a function just like we did in the previous examples. Uh, I can say, well, if I had an A, then I could, then I could produce a B. That's, these are the same things. That's what these rules say. And we're going to work from the bottom up. Um, logical. Cool. Uh, so we're really take, we're, we're, we're breaking the more complex types down. We're breaking down function types, uh, pairs, and ethers, and we're breaking them down into sort of their constituent uh, assumptions. So if I have a function, that means if somebody gives me an A, I can produce a B. And when you read the literature, everything is these, uh, these expressions. There's a, a sequence on the bottom, and there's more than zero, there's zero or more sequence on the top. And this is how they represent them. You'll see them everywhere. Uh, you can also go the other way. That's called reduction. So you have um, simpler formulas and you can, or you have, you have your sort of constituent parts and you can cons then construct something that's more complicated. Is entails an implication? Yes, entails. So we pronounce this uh, term style as entails. It is like implication, but we need a separate symbol. So uh, even though in types, a, a arrow B is a function in logic, A arrow B is implication in logic. Um, but when we want to break apart um, sort of the, the nature of the implication into something like this, we need a, uh, we need a separate symbol. But it, it is very much like implication. These formulas are a by implication. Um, if, so if, if, I, uh, if I had the conclusion A to B, that implies if I had A, I could produce B. Um, and then the implication can, in this formula can go both ways. So this is like implication but it's sort of a different version of implication in order to uh, break apart proofs and, and, and break apart these sequence into different forms. That's a very good question. Uh, so we're finally getting to rules. This is, this is sort of the things that we were doing in our heads. How do I implement uh, A to A? Or how do I implement the pair of A, B to A? We need to teach the computer how to do these primitive steps. So these are going to be the rules. Um, 
there's going to be some extra notation that we don't need to care about too much. There's like this gamma thing, which means whatever, you know, this other stuff that I don't care about. Um, so here's our rule. Uh, it says if I, if I want to conclude that there's a function and I can presume a bunch of other stuff that I don't really care about, um, I, I'm going to name this rule. Uh, it's, it, we give it a name. It'll be the right. Right means we're dealing with things on the right-hand side of the, the sequence. Uh, I'm acting on functions on the right-hand side. So I'm going to take a function and I can translate that into a, a new premise and a, and a conclusion. So if we can conclude A to B, then we can presume A implies or entails B. So lots of formula, but hopefully there's just a bit of a generalization there. It's following the logic. It's sort of encapsulating the logic that we were doing before. So my task as a, as a, as a student of these things was to turn this into code. So this is kind of what it looks like down here at the bottom. Uh, here's my rule. Uh, it has a name that I've implemented as a, as a, as a case object. Uh, and then there's a bit of a, a matching going on. It says, well, if there's a sequence, and I don't care what its uh, premise is, but if there's an implies, if A implies B, then I want to deduce successfully that this rule worked. That's going to be here. And I'm going to produce, so I'm down here, and I'm going to produce the top. This is what I'm recognizing with my, with my match statement. And I'm going to produce the thing on the top. So uh, I can produce more than one thing on the top. And I have a new sequence. I've broken apart this sequence. And I'm going to produce a new sequence that, that I had A implies B. But now A is going to be on the left-hand side. And B is going to be on the right-hand side. So this is how we encode what we're doing. And now a computer can start to do this for us. So there's a whole bunch of these rules. Um, and there's a whole bunch of systems that contain lots of different rules. So I didn't know how to model them. So I just created some data structures. Here's a system and it's a type parameter and it just contains a bunch of rules. There's, a, there's, there's system after system. Everybody was like, oh, I know how to make a cool uh, sequent calculus system, these are my rules. And they just, you know, they wrote them in their papers. Um, but now we can encode them in, in, uh, with some data structures. So the most famous one is this system called LK. I'll let uh, Luca pronounce the German. Um, here it is. Klassische uh, Prädikatenlogik. Thank you. I love it. Uh, so Gerhard Gensen uh, helped well, created this in 1934, so it's been around for a while. Uh, and it's a collection of these rules. It says, uh, 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 there are other ones, there's LJ for intuitionistic, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is the classic one for predicate logic. Um, there's uh, a million of these things. Uh, this, is, this is the most famous one because it was first. And basically, I just created an algebraic data type. So here's my, my rule. And there's going to be a whole bunch of other rules. Uh, and they sort of encode these uh, mathy things as, as data and as code. So here's the identity rule. It says, this is the thing that says we're done. If I have a premise that's also a conclusion, I'm done. Woohoo! All right. I'm going to start going faster. Uh, don't worry. I'm almost done. Um, so we have rules. Here's my rule. This is how I recognize if I want to do something, and then I can be done with it. Uh, what is a deduction? Well, you know, our, our rules might not actually match something. It, you know, there's going to be a whole set of rules. I have to try all of them until I find one that works. So there's a bit of uh, bookkeeping. You know, maybe my rule is stuck. It can't actually fire. Maybe it means I've, uh, I've succeeded, or maybe it produced a whole bunch of new rules, uh, a new sequence to sort of a, that are sub goals that are simpler. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. Then in the world of, of my code, that, here's my prover again. Uh, if you give me a sequence, I'm going to give you a proof. Uh, so in the end, here's my, uh, here's the formula that I want to prove. This is I have a tuple of A and B, and I want to produce an either AC. 
and I have it as data and I give my prover and I prove it and I prune the tree and I print it and here we go. Here's, here's the proof that we did before. Ta-da! It worked. So I was very happy. Um, here's the steps that we did. We, we had the function on the right. We broke it into the parts on the left and the right. We unpaired it. We, un, we chose A on the right and then we said, we're done. Ta-da! Um, so this is what I stole from the book. This is uh, in the world of math, trees grow the correct way. You know, I don't know, I'm a computer, computer, in a computer person, trees grow down. But in math, they grow up. So if you just turn your head upside down, you can see this is how they write it in math. There's these lines and they save a bunch of space and they're very compact. I have print lines, so it's a bit less compact. Uh, I want to do a fancier renderer, but I didn't have time. So that was this big leg. How do I translate formulas into proofs? How do I go from proofs to programs? Well, the basic idea is you take that proof tree. Uh, so we did this, we ripped apart our, our goal into these parts. The basic idea is that you go backwards. It says, I know, how to, I know how to write this function. That's the const function. If I have an A and a B and an A, well, that's just choose A. And then you work your way up uh, and th this should be a left. Um, but you basically build it up that way. Uh, this is where the wizardry comes in. And uh, I didn't actually get to implement this because it was, it was uh, I ran out of time and it was hard. Uh, so the way you would do it is you would build up some representation of the implementation here on the right hand side. Uh, and then if you are as cool as, as the uh, Curry Howard pr uh, project, which I originally stole this idea from, they do it with a macro. So that's like, I can, you, they produce an implementation at compile time. So that's just, I'm, that's too much for me, but I'll get there someday. So uh, to finish up, uh, SQL and calculus is really cool. Um, people love it. You, you can get a t-shirt for it. Um, that's really all the evidence I need, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's at, really at the basis of everything that we do in computer science. Uh, it's built into our compilers, into our programs. Uh, we can access it ourselves. Uh, it's used everywhere. Um, these logic programs, the world of logic is reachable inside of the computer also, which is great. And the way that you solve those problems is with the uh, sequent calculus. So I hope this was a good introduction. Uh, there's, there's so much more. I'm happy to, I have lots of references. Um, I do want to emphasize that I didn't know what I was doing. So I use these programming strategies to sort of help myself at, at each step. Uh, I created algebraic data types. I created type classes. I use structural recursion to just sort of bang out implementations. There's some interpretation going on. Uh, you just, I just sort of follow the steps. So it's really possible. Uh, thanks a lot. I hope uh, I'm, I'm excited about this conference. Uh, there's some links here. My slides will be online. Uh, I think we're starting to get into the next talk. So uh, I'm happy to, to answer any questions uh, now or, or offline, uh, but thanks very much. All right, is there time for questions or? Yeah, you're good. You have some time. We oh, started, okay. so go for it. I saw, I saw some note that uh, <laughs> it was, it was, all right, there were a couple of ones. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a newbie to this, so I was just happy to get stuff to print to the screen. So I was like, uh, once, I, once I got this printing out, I was like, yes, I'm done. Uh, I'll, I'll work on macros later. <laughs> um, there's great talks by uh, Phil Wadler, you know, like um, propositions as types, um, sort of very intellectually interesting stuff, but you can actually use it for, for various things. Now you'll be able to understand a little bit more some of these, uh, you know, academic papers. You'll see the line, you'll see gammas everywhere. Uh, you'll see the turn style. You're like, aha, I know what this means.
can I apply this to my day job? Well, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I mean, part of it is, I mean, yes, this is as low level as you can possibly get. It's like, it's equivalent to writing like the Lambda calculus. We don't do it all the time, but once we start getting into using our language and reflecting off of it, writing DSLs, um, you know, even sort of like type class derivation, like how does Circe work? Circe and all this, and you know, how do the implicit lookups work in Scala? It's all this. This is just sort of a uh, uh, encoding of all those rules of breaking types into their parts and putting them back together. Um, so it's sort of, it's, it's both intellectually interesting and it allows you to sort of really get into some, some deep things in the program. So if you're writing some engines or backend stuff, um, it's definitely a useful tool. Just like we don't necessarily use Lambda calculus all the time in our job, but it, it informs, uh, it informs a lot in our designs. Uh, and we can sort of, we can go down to those levels if we need to. Um, it wasn't intended necessarily to be particularly useful, but is more of, hey, this is, this underlies our, our, um, our field and, and we can figure it out. I figured it out and I'm, I'm not that hot. So, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can do these things and I encourage other folks to, to sort of explore. All right, thanks very much. I'll, I'll sign off here.